uh, that's what I'm going to talk to you about in times of doubt and discouragement. Um, I'm going to give you a word and then I'm going to give you a verse. There's no outline. Uh, the whole theme of what I'm trying to do is to get you to understand that God's love is so overpowering, it's captivating. And in your times of doubt and difficulty, that's when the enemy will come against you. And uh, I've got a little clip, and then I'm going to be back. And again, I don't know how this is going to go, but I'm just going to trust the Holy Spirit. And uh, I, I just believe the Scriptures are more powerful than any man's outline. I, I, I believe that. After last week, when I just let the Scripture speak and kind of define its own self, someone said, man, I really like that. You ever get in the Bible, you'll, you'll never be able to stop, and uh, it'll speak to you on every page. So just watch this opening clip as people get settled. Um, you know, I, let, me, let me say this. I, I, I've, I've been wanting to do it for some time, and, and, and this, there's no negativity in this at all, but there's a lot of folks. we got a lot of open seats toward the front. Don't be afraid <laughs> to move from the back to the front. You'll be shocked the power of a move, a power of a change. Uh, some people, I think, get a little intimidated uh, by the front. And, and let me just say, the front is where you see the battle being done in the greatest way instead of looking from a distance. God wants us to look up close and personal. So during this clip, if you want to get up and move, you're not going to bother me. And I promise you, I won't spit on you. <laughs> and I won't single you out if you move toward the front. Amen. And uh, watch this, and I'll be back and pray for me that this first will be pleasing to the Lord and to you. All right? Love has the power to change someone's day, to lift someone's heart, to comfort someone's soul. Love is a language that everybody speaks, men and women, young and old, rich and poor. Love is the character of God, who loved us before we loved Him, who loved us so we could love one another. Love is not just a feeling, it's a commitment, not just an emotion, it's a decision. Love is about giving, not getting. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. This is the power of love. Amen. Amen. have your Bibles, turn to the book of Ephesians, the book of Ephesians, where I can just kind of start, and again, we're just going to let this scripture speak, and uh, in Ephesians chapter 3, starting at verse number 14, Paul says this, he said, for this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the to the riches of His glory, to be strengthened with might through His Spirit in the inner man. So the real motivating thing here today and the thing that I want you to see is that you can be strengthened by the power and the might of God in your inner person. The inner person is what God looks at. It's what God communes with. We think sometimes because we raise our hands or we do a certain thing that God is acknowledging that. God always reads the heart. He doesn't really look at your external. He looks at the intents of the heart and what the heart produces, and out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. If you're full of God, you're going to speak things full of God. If you're full of God in your worship, you're going you're to speak those things. If you're full of God and you love God and you love the Word of God, what will come out of your mouth is the Word of God. So it, it, it's, it's one of those things that he talks about here, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man. Verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Now the inner man is that Christ is going to dwell in your heart through faith. That you being rooted and grounded in love. Now that's, that's just huge. You're rooted and grounded in love. 
And a lot of people never are never sure, and I, I need your response and your help. There are a lot of people who are never sure if they're really saved and if God really loves them. They're sure on a Sunday maybe, but they're not sure on a Monday. They're sure when things go well, but when things go bad, they always have this doubt, does God really love me? Or when they are on that spiritual high and they forget that they can get on that spiritual low and they do the things they don't want to do and they get out of fellowship with what they should do and they feel like God doesn't love them because they don't feel the presence of God in their life. Now, am I speaking to anybody in here just say amen? I think every one of us deal with doubt and every one of us deal with discouragement. And he says that the inner man being rooted and grounded in love I don't believe that we put enough emphasis on being rooted and grounded in love because love is life-changing. Love is the very character of God that's being poured out for you. Love is what God wants you to see, and a lot of people get caught up on the justice of God or the holiness of God, and believe me, God is holy, and He's so holy that His love has to be so pure because of God's holiness. There, there's nothing in God outside of His holiness that's more important than His holiness. But we see the other attributes that flow from Him, but the very character, if you had one word to describe God in His holiness that would say, what do we have? We would say we have a loving, holy God. A loving, holy God. And His love is absolutely pure as His love, is, uh, as His holiness is pure. There's, there's no shadow of turning in Him, the Scripture says, whatsoever. So we have to be rooted and grounded in love. And I say that because a lot of people are rooted and grounded in fellowship or rooted and grounded in religion. Or, there are some people that moved. <laughs> Rooted and grounded in a certain attitude or a certain church or a certain man, but he says that the inner man is to be strengthened by faith and that we're to be rooted and grounded in love. In other words, that's the thing that we, we draw our strength from, love. And, of course, we know that God is love. And then he says this, that I love these verses, that that you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the height or what is the width, the length, the depth, and the height of God's love. To know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now a lot of people get caught up on being filled with the Spirit. And there's the, being filled with the Spirit is good, but you're never going to be filled with the Spirit until you're filled with the fullness and the love of God. A lot of people want that external thing because man has tried to take what's supposed to be internal and he's turned it into an external thing. And that's what Satan wants. He wants us to get focused on the things that don't matter so much instead of the things that do matter. What really matters is the heart condition of where you're at. And he says, I want you to be able to comprehend because you're rooted and grounded in love, what the love of, of God is, the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. You've got to comprehend with all the saints the width, the length, the depth, and the height. In other words, he's giving us these words to say, no matter how high you look, how deep you go, or how far the east is from the west, you're going to find that God's love is what is being communicated, and I want you to try to comprehend it. And, and you say, that's such a hard task, because the fullness of God comes with that. So someone says, what, how do you handle the, the discouragement and the doubt? How do you handle doing what you do? And I, I can only say, because I'm a word man, I can only say that I go to the Scriptures. I'm going to give you some selected Scriptures today that will help you understand a little bit more about the love of God, okay? I'm going to give you one word instead of an outline, and then and it comes from the Scripture itself. Now, you, you'll see the theme. Knowing and believing. Well, actually, that's a couple words. Okay, you wrote this down. Number one, knowing and believing. And in 1 John 4, 16, it says this, So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. If you've never come to the place where you have come to know and to believe that about God's love and the love He has for, for you, then you're missing out. Odds are, if you don't understand how much He loves you, odds are you're not saved. 
You're just not. He said because it's believing, knowing and believing. When you know and you believe about God's love for us, it drives you to a place or draws you to a place that you want to make that decision for Christ. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, what? I'll draw all men unto me. When he goes to the cross, we see the love of God and we see that we're drawn there. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love and whoever abides in love abides in God and God in him. Now I want you to ponder this for a moment. God is love. And we talk about God being a spirit. That's his essence. His personality is love. It's not hate. It's not, it's not judgment. It's not anything. It's love. God sent Jesus to die for us because he loves us. And we would never know the love of God if Jesus had never come in the form of flesh. Man couldn't comprehend how much God loved them. And he comes full of grace and truth, and we see the love of God when Christ comes. And, and you, when you think about it, at the core of his being, he is love itself, and that love overflows to you. When God draws you to him, the one thing that overflows is his love for you. When you see Jesus on the cross, you don't really, I mean, at, at the core of it all, you don't see Jesus suffering on the cross. You don't. You don't see Jesus bleeding on the cross. If that's what you see first, then you're making an emotional decision. When you see Jesus on the cross, you should see the love of God. The love of God put Jesus on the cross so that you might have life. Not just someone who was beaten and you feel sorry for him and look how he's bleeding and, and, and look at this and, and, and it's so pitiful. No, I want you to understand, no one took his life. He laid it down freely because he loved you. And God put him there. God wanted you to see how much he loved you. And at the core of his being, he is love itself, and that love overflows to you. And if you are in Christ, you are so deeply loved that you can't even comprehend it. And Paul writes to the church at Ephesus and writing to us today that I want you to have the inner man to focus with the strength of God on what is the height, the depth, and the length, and the breadth of God's love so that you can comprehend it. In fact, God loves you so much that He has literally chosen to abide in you through the Holy Spirit. You are a temple of the Holy Spirit. You are having union with God whether you realize it or not. The Holy Spirit is in you, and you're having union. Whether it be good union or bad union, you're having union with God because the Holy Spirit is in you. Let me just say this. God loves you so much, He goes everywhere you go. Everywhere you go. Everything you do, He's there. And any time of trouble, He's always there. It's incredible when you think about it. So first thing you write down is knowing and believing, 1 John 4, 16. Let me give you number two. No outline. 1 John 4, 18. Because write these words down, no fear. When you start to comprehend the love of God, the height, the depth, the length, and the breadth, so that the inner man can be strengthened, you'll have no fear. In every relationship, in every marriage, there's always the fear that someone will not love them like they should. Can I get an amen from everybody? When you get older and you feel rejected and you think life hasn't turned out well and relationships break up, you have this fear that I'll never find anyone who will love me. Now, I know I'm speaking the truth here. Love is a powerful thing. A neglected child, a child raised on one parent, always has a fear of not being loved the way that other people are loved. And they're always weighing their life compared to someone else because of that fear. That fear is there. And when you get outside the will of God and you get outside uh, and you get in your flesh and you get outside of the real you, because if you're born again, you are a new creature in Christ Jesus, but you still know how to act like the old you. You never forget how to act like the old you because Satan's constantly going to remind you and show you pictures of the old you. And if Satan doesn't do it, there'll be somebody else that does it for him. Can I get an Amen. There'll be always somebody will give you this, but. God loves you, but. God loves you, and, and I, know you, I know you've been saved, but. But you used to be this. But you did that. But can you overcome this? But are you good enough? But are you able to go forward? But did God really forgive you? But have you really forsaken that thing? It'll always be there, and that fear is there. 1 John four eighteen says, There is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear. Let me just give a word of advice to every man here that's married. Love your wife with a perfect love. Boy, I got quiet. A perfect love. 
cast out her fear, her fear that you will always love her. Make it go away. Show her every day how much you love her. And wives, you can flip that coin to the other side. You show him the same thing. Because that's commitment. If you wake up every day saying, I'm going to do something to show that partner that I love them. And, and the scripture says, there is no fear in, perfect, in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. I want Phyllis to know that I love her, and she don't ever have to worry. And I want to know that she loves me, and I don't ever have to worry. And God wants me to know that He loves me, and I never have to worry that He loves me. And He loved me when I was unlovable. He loved me when I didn't love Him. It's perfect love. God's love for you is a perfect love. It's so deep. An ocean so endless that you can never exhaust it. God loves you with such a profound love that it drives out fear. Now, I don't know about you, but that's good love. And good love will lead to good loving. It will. And I say that in a, phys in a physical sense and in a spiritual sense. With your wife and with your husband, it'll lead to a, a very uh, a intimate relationship that's no longer physical but it's become spiritual because the two become what one flesh and there's no fear in that there's no fear there's no 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 worry but spiritually i can be intimate with the father i can be intimate, not in an ugly way but in an intimate way that i can tell him my deepest closest most profound inner thoughts of my heart and I never have any fear that he will not love me it'll be intimate it'll be so intimate that you'll weep sometimes it'll be one of those things that brings a calming and a peace to your heart it's perfect love it casts out fear you don't need to fear being punished by God because he loves you he already punished Jesus on the cross for you you don't, he won't punish you. He punished Jesus. Jesus paid the debt. Perfect love cast out fear. That requires faith. I, I know you need to understand that. But God, if you look back, God has never failed you. And God has never stopped loving you. And the Scripture teaches there's nothing that can separate you from the love of God. There's no punishment. If you are in Christ, there is no punishment or wrath remaining. You don't have to worry about the end of life. Am I going to be punished? There is therefore now no condemnation of them here in Christ Jesus. It was all placed on Jesus. All that is left for you is God's love. Number three. You say, Pastor, again, in times of discouragement and doubt, what do you do? I just go to the Scriptures. They're powerful. They're powerful. Number three. Write this little phrase down, full of mercy full of mercy oh man what are you talking about if anyone ever needs mercy it's it's us that don't do right when we should do it can i get an amen, amen. if anybody ever needs mercy it's people that are sinners of which i am chief as paul would say full of mercy every time i turn around i need mercy i need mercy i love this number three but god i love that but god but God, being rich in mercy. King James says, who is rich in mercy? Because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. You know what grace is? Mercy. Grace translates getting something you don't deserve. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We should die for our sins, but God loved us so much that He sent Jesus to die for our sins. Now that we're saved, we live and we bask under the mercy because God is rich and full in His mercy. At my very worst, if He loved me. Now listen to this logic. At my very worst, if, if, if He loved me, because it says, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sin, made us alive together with Christ. In my very worst, if he loved me, and God is immutable, unchangeable. He is the creator. There's not a human being around that can change God. If God changes in some way, he would be lying in the scripture. I'm the same yesterday, 
Today and forever I change not, he tells us in the book of Hebrews. So if God loved me at my very worst when I was dead in my trespasses and sins, but now I've been made alive by him because of which he loved me, and I sin still, do you think that I would lose the love of God because of that? At my worst, my very worst, he loved me. Now I'm not my worst anymore. I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus, even though I've sinned, but I'm not who I used to be. Do you think if he loved me then at my very worst, he now will not love me at my best? He's going to love me at my best, and my best is not because I've been good, but I've been made, and I have victory because of what Christ has done, because of Christ's righteousness. I'm better than I've ever been because I don't have my righteousness. I have the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And if I, if, if God, if I, I get in this doubt and this discouragement, I have to be reminded that God is rich and full of His mercy. And when I needed it the most, I got it. And now when I'm saved, I can still get it. God has got plenty of mercy to go around because of His love for me. I was dead in my trespasses and sin, unable and unwilling to love God. You were an enemy of God prior to your salvation, a slave to sin, completely unable to save yourself. But God's love is stronger than even your worst sins. And I don't know what sins you've committed or you are committing now, but I am not, I, I've been doing this thing a long time. And let me tell you, brother, I know the church house is full of people who are messing with some bad stuff. We, we cover it up, we justify it. As the Scripture says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just. That's mercy to forgive us. That's mercy. So when you think about full of mercy and God's love, God loves you so much that every time you come to Him and say, God, will you forgive me? God, will you give me mercy? You're going to get it. There's never going to be a time where God will tell you, no, I'm not giving you mercy. I'm not forgiving you. you God will always show you mercy because of His love for you. And by the way, what you learn from that is you need to show everyone else mercy because of the love you have for one another that the world may know you're my disciples, as the clip said. John 13, 34. Therefore, love one another as I have loved you, and by this the world will know you're my disciples. Because of God's great love for you, He made you spiritually alive in Christ. He breathed spiritual life into you when you were a spiritual corpse, not that you couldn't reason, not that you were totally bad, you were made in the image of God, but we had no real spirituality the Holy Spirit came in. And we're better than we once were, and if He loved us at our worst, He's certainly going to love us when we're better. Amen. We're not perfect. Let me give you number four. If you're still with me now, say amen. I don't have an outline. Write, write this down. Steadfast. Steadfast. When I have doubt, when I have discouragement, most, most of the time, and most people will say, well, I want to quit. I want to quit. I just don't like quitters. I don't like people who start and don't finish. I don't. Even my kids, my grandkids, we may not say you need to do it again, but if you start something, you're going to finish it. You may not have to sign back up for it after this season's over or after this period is over or after this phase is over, but you're not going to quit. If you start learning to quit, you will quit in other things. Steadfast. But number four, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. Psalms 103, 11. God's love is steadfast. It never quits. God doesn't stop loving you. Aren't you glad? It does, he, he doesn't stop loving you. David is reaching and stretching to find adequate words to describe God's love in Psalms 103, verse 11. His steadfast love is higher than the heavens are above the earth. God's love for you is so vast, so massive, David, David relies on the solar system to describe it. He said it's so fast, it's so amazing, it's so big, it's so beautiful. It is steadfast. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. Steadfast. Because it's amazing how God is. That's why Paul writes, I want you to be able to comprehend with the inner man so that you can be strengthened by faith what you see, the height, the depth, the length, and the breadth. See, nobody can really describe how beautiful, amazing, vast God's love is. You have to 
Think about this. You have to ponder it. The distance between earth and Jupiter may be vast, but God's love for you is even greater. You can't escape the love of God. You can't come to the end of it, and you can't exhaust it. No matter how long you live, you will never outlive the love of God. No matter how far you run from God, you can never run from the love of God. No matter how you hide from God, you can never hide from the love of God. It will always find you. And it'll always come after you. That's why I love the song that they say, He leaves the ninety and nine and comes after the one. You might be running from God here this morning, but I can promise you this. It's not the wrath of God that's chasing you. It is the love of God that's chasing you. It's not that God's trying to tackle you, strike you down, hogtie you, and drag you back. God wants you to come and acknowledge Him, and, and, and He's coming after you so that He can show you how much He loves you. If you take the prodigal and look at what the Father's doing, He's watching every day from the sun to come home from the pig pen, and He's out every day looking for the sun to come on the horizon. Every day, And when he sees his son, he doesn't stand, Jesus says. The father runs to the son and embraces him. Listen to me. You don't have to cautiously. And as I see that picture, it, this just hit me. Holy Spirit just showed me something else to add to the picture. The Scripture says that God watches every day, and he sees the, the son coming from afar off. One thing it leaves out, because the son's apprehensive. If you read the story, he says, I'll just go back and I'll be one of the servants. The servants are doing better than, than this. I'm, I'm going to go back in my father's house. The servants got it better than I do. And every day the father's praying and hoping that the son will come. And then you got this wayward brother that's saying, Daddy, why are you out there all day? And you got the servants that are looking saying, Oh, man, this is such a, a sad tale. The son's gone. He's never coming back. He squandered everything. And, 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 and you find the father standing there and he sees the son afar off. But one thing that leaves out, that the apprehension, the apprehension in the son's heart when God starts to run toward the son, can you imagine that son sprinting toward the father? And what you miss out is the embrace. You miss out that collision of love coming together, that acceptance, that love, and he's kissing him out on his neck and on his cheek, and he's crying out, get the fatted calf, get the ring, get the robe. He said, my son was lost, but now he has found Woo! Man, it's a steadfast love. It never goes away because you, let me just say it this way, you screw up. I want to say it in a way you can understand it. Most people say, man, I, I, I just screwed up, man, I messed up. So that prodigal, but we find the father running, and I can just imagine when the son is thinking in his mind, I can't believe this. The father's running to me, and his arms are open wide, and I bet you that boy sprinted home, and here's God's, this is what he wants you to see when he's leaving the 90 and 9. He's not coming to judge you. He's coming to love you. It's the love of God that should have you come back, and that's why God is going looking. God, if God wanted to judge you, he'd just speak it, and you'd be vaporized. You'd be done. But he leaves the 90 and 9. Let me give you number five. You're still with me now? Say amen. No outline. Jeremiah 31, 3. Write this word down, everlasting. Where God says, I have loved you with an everlasting love, therefore I have continued my faithfulness to you. Jeremiah 31, 3. That's an amazing thought. An everlasting love. Do you understand what everlasting is? It'll never stop. <laughs> it never ends. It's everlasting. You can't use it up. You can't use it up. A lot of couples will use up their love in the first couple of years of marriage or maybe three or four years, and they say, well, we've just grown apart. God's love's not like that. It's an everlasting love. It's a love that's, that is sustaining. It's a love that stays. It's a love that, that God is constantly showing that action for. It's one of those amazing things. It's an amazing thought. Do you believe that God has loved you with an everlasting, everlasting love? Before you were even formed in the womb, He set His love upon you. Before you were formed in the womb. You say, how can that be? You're going to have to ask God that. I can't answer that question. I just know that He is the Creator and we are the created. And I know the sanctity of life matters to God. I'm going to throw this in for free. Think about all the abortions of all the people that God knew in the womb. Mm. And that He loved with an everlasting love. You say, what will happen to those babies? An everlasting love, it starts in the womb. In heaven, in heaven, those babies will be alive. It's an everlasting love. It never goes away based on what man does. 
Before you were even formed in the womb, He set His love upon you. And you, when you were born, God loved and delighted in you. And every day since, God has not stopped loving you with the same incredible breath that He did then. He doesn't stop loving you. God loves you so much, He has been and will continue to be faithful to you. God will never leave you nor forsake you. Hasn't God always been faithful to you? The verse says, I have loved you with an everlasting love, therefore I have continued my faithfulness to you. Hasn't He always cared and provided for you? It's because God loves you with an everlasting, beginning to end, careless, reckless, ceaseless love. I love that song because the, the, the words seem controversial to some people that God's love is reckless. It defines itself. It's reckless. If there's a wall in the way, God's going to knock it down like he's just exploding into the wall. It's reckless that God is going to take a, a, a spiritual wrecking ball and knock the wall down. If anything comes between you and him, it's going to be reckless. He's going to love you in such an unfathomable way that we, we find that it, it, it just doesn't register with us sometimes. But God's love is real. It's sometimes unattainable to comprehend it, but if you'll ponder it in your times of doubt and discouragement, it'll certainly get you out of that discouraged state. Let me give you number six. It's giving action. Giving action. John three sixteen. Had to throw this one in. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. How much does God love you? It's action. God loved you so much that He gave you the most precious thing that we could ever think. Think about it. He gave His only Son for you. He wanted you to have eternal life. He was willing to sacrifice His precious and beloved Son. And now when you believe in God, or in the Son, God rejoices and gives you eternal life. Let me ask you this. Would you give up one of your children? Let's just be real honest and real open. There would not be one person who says, yes, I'd give up my child. Kenny, you wouldn't give up your babies, would you? No. Nobody would. Phyllis, would you give up any of your babies? Mm -mm. There ain't anybody in here who give up a child, would they? And God says, I've got to be extreme. I've got to show them something because, see, they've never seen me love them like that before. They've never seen what I'm all about. I'm going to give up the most precious thing that I own, my only begotten son. My only child, I'm going to give him up. I'm going to raise him in a sinless, perfect way. I'm going to show in him what love and kindness is all about. And then at the end, when the time is right, when the appointed time has come, I'm going to take his life so that they might have life. You're talking about love. None of you would ever give up a child. But God says, I gave my only begotten son. And if you'll believe, if you'll believe in me, you'll have eternal life because that's why I did it. That's why I did it. See, God's love put Jesus on the cross, not God's wrath. You say, wait a minute, God punished him on the cross. He punished him because of his justice and his holiness because his love demanded that sin had to be paid for. And his love is shown because you couldn't pay the debt. The only one who could was Jesus, and Jesus knew he could do it. Because the Father told him he could do it. And on the cross, he became sin for us who knew no sin so that we might see the love of God. And when he said, Te telestai, it is finished. Not only was the payment for sin done, but the example for us to see how much God loves us was to be able to see by everybody. And the cross that used to be a picture of shame is now a picture of victory because of the love of God. Jesus died on the cross because of love. Because of love. That's what that verse is always about. Be encouraged by this. You are a child of God, loved by God, adopted by God. Let me give you inclusive. Number seven. 1 John 3, 1. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. Do you understand how inclusive that is? God says you're a child of God. You're a child of God. It is a glorious, amazing, overwhelming thing to be called a child of God. 
We call him Father. We don't call him God. We call him Father. He's our Heavenly Father. And the relationship really grows. We call him Abba Father, Daddy God. It's a very personal family type relationship. Why, why would God allow him being so holy to do that? Because we can't comprehend who he is. So we get this theological term, this anthropomorphism or an anthropopathism where God says, I'm going to adopt you, you're going to be my children, because you can understand that in human terms, but in the spiritual terms of the eternal God, the creator with the created, our relationship is going to be exactly the same that you know. But I'm going to say this, it's going to be greater than that, because even in our human relationships, they're flawed. They're flawed. Children get angry with parents. Parents get angry with kids. But I want you to understand in our relationship with the Heavenly Father, when His love comes and that inclusive love, it is a perfect love. It's totally inclusive. He doesn't have favoritism of one child over another child. He loves you the same. It is because God deeply wanted to, for you to be in His family. I've had numerous friends who have adopted. I have a daughter that's adopted uh, what is it, uh, three children. And I can say certainly that only deep, profound love motivates a person to adopt. And if you've been adopted by God, as Scripture says, that you've been adopted, it's a, another way, another term that we understand how God brings us into His family. It's hard to comprehend because we know we don't deserve it. And it's only love that makes that happen. It's an intense love that I'm going to sacrifice everything and I'm going to provide everything for them and they're going to be equal with me as I adopt them into my family. So it's super important. Be encouraged that by this. You are a child of God, loved by God, adopted by God, and there's nothing that anybody can do about it. Even when you mess up, even when you're in your sin, you're still a child of God. Super important. Number eight. 1 John 3, 16. 1 John 3, 16. By this, here's the word, sacrificial. By this, we know love, that He laid down His life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. 1 John 3, 16. A sacrificial point that we come to, that we ought to be willing to give up our life for the benefit of others. It doesn't mean that you're going to have to die for somebody. That's not what he's talking about. That you live your life a living sacrifice that's holy and acceptable to him that you look at someone else and you need to make a sacrifice for them. You need to go out of your way to help them. You need to go out of your way to show the love of God. And see, most of us won't do anything sacrificially because it pushes our limits and our bounds and we have fear and we don't trust God. But if we do, if we do, we may win that brother or sister to Christ. What is the most profound way that God could prove His love for you? By embracing death on your behalf. He, he laid down His life for you. Ponder this glorious truth for a moment. God, the immortal, eternal, almighty God, the lasting one, took on flesh and blood. The Creator entered into this broken, sinful, wicked world and died on a shameful cross for you and me. He laid down His life for us. And then He says, we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. When people say, how do you handle the discouragement and the doubt that comes? I'm reminded, I'm reminded that God did this for me and there's somebody out there that's a whole lot worse off than I am because I'm saved and they may not be and he laid down his life for them and it makes me refocus and retool my thinking when I start having my little pity party that he laid down his life for me he loved me enough to do that and I am commanded to lay down my life for the brethren and I can't quit and I can't sit there and sob and say poor me nobody loves me what are you talking about nobody loves you you just blasphemed against almighty God when God loved you so much with an everlasting love and you say God doesn't love me because I'm going through this difficult time well, you need to come to my Bible study on Wednesday night as we talk about James amen count it all joy when you fall into various trials you will find out how much God really does love you when the trials come it's so important. The one who gives eternal life allowed himself to be swallowed by death. As it says in John 15, 13, greater love has no man than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. That's the way we understand it. Jesus doesn't want you to die. He just wants you to live. He wants you to live for him and others. That includes your friends. Even Jesus went a step further and said, love your enemies. Love your enemies. You say, wait a minute. It's easy for me to love someone else. Yeah, I know. It's easy for those to love you. Jesus said that. But when you love your enemies, you're now reflecting the image of God who is love to them that they may never see. Because, see, they're not looking to the heavens. 
They're dead in their trespasses and sins. They're not looking to the heavens, but they're looking at you. And when you reflect the love of God, all of a sudden there's something in their heart. Love is so powerful, it can change a cold, hard, wicked heart because of what you have shared with them. They'll say, you want to help me? You want to love me? You want to accept me? It's important. Number nine. So how many of these you got? A lot. Only a few more. No outline. Write this word down. Progressive revelation. Romans 5.5. 5. God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Romans 5.5. 5. You know what God does? He loves you so much. It's progressive revelation. Now, I'm going to use the term pity party. I've already said it, but I should have set it up because every one of us have those. Can I get the hands of everyone who has had a pity party in the last year? Raise your hand. Man, I can't believe some of you are even lying saying, I ain't had no pity party in a year. First John 1, 9, then we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in you. Amen, you're lying. Good thing you don't go to hell for lying. Amen. Here we are, we have our pity parties. God knew exactly how we would act and react, and he says, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit who is going to give you progressive revelation. Progressive revelation means that it's an ongoing thing when you start in, in intertwining yourself with God. His Word is progressive revelation. You learn one principle, you get another, and all of a sudden there's more revelation when you learn another principle. Precept upon precept, step upon step, a process with the process, verse by verse, exegetically, the, all of those terms come together. Progressive revelation. The Holy Spirit is always progressing your revelation of God. It might be through His Word, it might be through experience, it might be through something else, but it's progressive revelation. And the more we serve God, the, more, the longer you're saved, the more you should understand how much God loves you and what His love is all about. So it's progressive revelation. Let me read it again, Romans 5, 5. God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit He's been given to us. God doesn't want you to know His love or just to know His love intellectually. Many people who study their Bible, they really get it intellectually. They get it. These verses I'm writing down, they, if somebody's going to miss one, I promise you, and they're going to come back and they're going to say, what was number four? I want to write it down. What was number seven? I want to write it down. But it's not just about knowing intellectually. God cares so deeply for you that He wants you to know His love in experience. He wants you to know it experientially. He wants you to experience His love every day that you live. It's not just about knowing it intellectually. It's about living it out and experiencing His love. And there's nothing greater than experiencing God's love. How does He make it happen? He's poured the Holy Spirit into our heart, and the Spirit assures you that God loves you. Would the Holy Spirit take up residence in your heart if God didn't deeply and profoundly love you? The Holy Spirit is God. And he's, he's taking residence in your heart to assure you that God loves you. He's called the paracletote, the one called alongside. Just like a paramedic, paracletote comes from, that paramedic word comes from that one called alongside. Why? Because when doubt and discouragement comes, the Holy Spirit is going to say, don't have a pity party. I have progressively shown you all the days of your life how much God loves you and how good God is. And he'll start to reveal those verses. He'll start to reveal those songs, the goodness of God, the reckless love of God, victory in Jesus. He'll start to reveal in progressive revelation, and he'll show you something at the point of your pity party that'll snap you out of it. Or he'll bring someone into your life that'll do the same thing. The Holy Spirit in you both assures you of God's love and proves the staggering depths of God's love for you. Here's another word, number 10, helpless. It says this, Romans 5, verses 6 through 8, And while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Love this next verse. For one will scarcely die for a righteous man, though perhaps a good person one would even dare to die for. But God shows His love for us, and while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Helpless. I was helpless. 
in my trespasses and sin. I couldn't save myself. And see, the world has gotten people to the mindset that they can be good, they can be moral, they can be ethical, and they can save themselves. It's impossible. It's impossible. While I was still sinner, still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. See, he died for sinners. There's no cleanup required to come to him. No cleanup required. God didn't wait for you to be clean uh, to clean up your act before he died for you. He took you as you were. Aren't you glad? He took you as you were. I mean, I don't know about you, but I got saved as a 12-year-old boy. You say, how bad could a 12-year-old boy be? I don't think a 12-year-old boy was too bad, but I think a 12-year-old boy will grow up to be a grown man and he'll be real bad. We all have the potential to be real bad. I believe that's why God desperately wants children to be saved when they're young. And that's why it's very difficult for an older person to get saved when they're older. They live such a bad life, they believe the lie of the devil that God's love cannot forgive them from all the wrong that they've done. Love's powerful reaching arm will. There's no cleanup required. At your worst, it happened while you were still a sinner. He died for you. Helpless. Isn't that such good news? That's not sad news. I was a sinner. You were a sinner. And His love reached out and died for us when we didn't deserve it. That's good news. That goes back to December 25. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, Christ the Lord, who will be a Savior to all people. And the angels cry out, Peace on earth and goodwill toward men. That's the good news. That's the gospel. When that act happens and God love comes in and we're helpless and no cleanup required, God will take you just as you are because He loves you so much. You say, how can He love me? I don't know. And I'm on number 10 and I still don't know how He could love you that way. Because I hadn't figured out why He loves me that way. But I do know this, by faith my inner man is strengthened that I might find the fullness of His love in me. And in my times of disappointment, I have to be reminded of the good news that Jesus died because the Father loved me and wanted me to have union with Him in an everlasting love. Man, that's, that's beyond comprehension. Helpless. Here's a good one, Romans 8.35. Write the word down, no separation. Number 11, no separation. How do you handle doubt and discouragement, Pastor Mike? How do you handle it when it comes your way? What do you do? I just get in the Scripture when I read this verse. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? So tribulation, distress, pity party, crying fit, angerness, bitterness. How I many have you ever been bitter toward God? Angry at God? Upset with God? Curse God. Mm. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, trial, difficulty, distress? No. Persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword? I mean, you, you can read on and on through that. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. God's love for you is so strong, so invincible, so powerful that nothing can separate you from it. The worst trials, the deepest pain, the greatest anger. God's sustaining love is present. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. You can't abandon. God can't abandon those that He loves because He cannot lie. When He quotes all of these scriptures by the Holy Spirit and they're penned, God is writing them in an eternal book. Heaven and earth will pass away. What? The Word of God is going to endure forever. It'll never change. That's why for 2,000 years, people have been getting saved the same way. Doubt and discouragement has been handled the same way through the Holy Scriptures as their God breathed, as though God breathed them Himself, as they were penned by holy men of God guided by the Holy Spirit. We can have confidence in it. It's one of those things that's super, super understandable. God's love is an unshakable foundation. 
Even when God calls you to go through the deep waters and the fiery trials, you won't be overrun with sorrows, and His love will sustain you and keep you. I bet right now some of you are thinking about, oh man, I was in a deep river and I was over flooded with grief and with anger and with hurt and pain and I cried every day and it seemed like I could never stop crying. Am I speaking to anybody? Say amen. Every time I thought I was better, I'd cry the next day and every time I'd hear a verse, I'd cry or every time I was reminded of my failure, I'd cry. I, I mean, just think about it. Just think about it. But every time you go through those things, through the deep waters and the fiery trials, you won't be overrun with his sorrows or with those sorrows because he's always with you. Always. Number 12. Titus 3, 4, and 5. Mercy. Mercy. Hmm. But when the goodness and the loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. Mercy. So that sounds like we've used that before. I know. I always have to be reminded I need mercy. Sometimes I need it in different ways, but I need mercy. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His mercy. See, everywhere you look through Scripture, you're going to find His mercy. This is an incredible thing. It's a life-giving verse. Why did God save you? Hmm. Was it because you had everything together and you were righteous? Was it because you were somehow worthy of saving? Was it because you had something special to offer and that no one else had? Not in the least. God saved you because of His goodness and His loving kindness. And He looked upon you and your sinful brokenness, and He says this. This is hard to imagine. And your sinfulness your brokenness and in your pain and in your struggle and in your rejection and in your doubt and your discouragement God looks right at you and he says I love you I love you I love you it's not because of our works but Titus says Paul says and writes to Titus but according to his own mercy when you wake up in the morning and you look in the mirror you're not going to see Mike Lindell like that commercial is. When you look in the mirror, if you'll look deep enough, you'll see God looking right back at you and saying, I love you today. Because in that mirror, see, we see the reflection. And if that inner man is going to grow by faith, that you may be able to comprehend, that you may be able to comprehend. Let me go back and let's look at that. Let's read the text one more time. When you think about it, it's one of those incredible things that you have. He says this, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man. Hmm. The inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, the length, the depth, and the height, and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now here's a verse that I didn't read the first time. Because here's what will happen. If you start to comprehend that, that inner man be strengthened, this is what you're going to see. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we ask or think. Oh, wow. According to the power that works in us. Uh-oh. The Holy Spirit. God is going to do something exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think. According to the power that works in us. See, when you're able to comprehend the love of God, it changes everything in you. And in your time of doubt and discouragement, you need to have confidence because of His love that whatever you ask or think, you hadn't even thought about it, that God is doing a work in you. That, that's an incredible verse. Now, to Him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly, I love those superlative adjectives, 
exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think because sometimes you don't even know what to ask you don't even know what to think to get you out of your doubt or your discouragement but you know this God loves you God loves you you need to be reminded you need the little nudge sometimes you need the little punch in the arm or the little kick on the tail or the little slap on the behind or or a hug or a word but you need to be reminded that God loves you and then all of a sudden you say I don't even know what to ask or or what I've even thought about all this but he's exceedingly abundantly able to do above all that we ask or think because see God wants you to understand how much he loves you And he's putting himself on display for you to see who he is because he is love. And he wants you to be love. He wants you to love. He wants you to love like he loves. He wants you to love one another. Husbands, love your wives. as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. I mean, you can go all through the Bible, and it's all about love. It's all about God's love. It's all about people loving one another. It's all about that. See, that is the very nature of who God is. You say, so, Pastor, what are you saying at the end of the day? I'm saying this, God loves you. But let me also say this. If you've never experienced His love, because, see, you can't understand really the love of God until you accept Jesus Christ. You can only understand the love of humanity. Because you've never, you've never experienced God's love until you accept by faith what God did for you. Because once you accept what God did for you because He loved you, then you become a new creature in Christ Jesus. The Holy Spirit comes to abide. And when the Holy Spirit comes in, He starts working on the inner man. See, you don't understand how much God loves you when you come to get saved. You just see a picture that God does love you. And the Holy Spirit has drawn you to that. And the moment you trust in that, the Holy Spirit comes to abide in you forever. And the moment the Holy Spirit comes to abide in you forever, now all of a sudden you can start to see how really wonderful and beautiful God is. You just understood the sin thing, that Jesus paid your price. But when the Holy Spirit starts to reside, that inner man starts to grow on the love of God. And here's what happens. He loved you while you were still a sinner, and He loved you before you loved Him. And after you see what Christ did for you, and the Holy Spirit starts to reveal, now all of a sudden you start to love God. And you start to see God operate in that love. And the relationship, see, relationship has only been birthed at the point of salvation, but that progressive revelation that God gives you through the Holy Ghost, through the Holy Spirit, allows you to see His love in perfection. It'll start to cast out fear. It'll cast out doubt. It can be healing. It can keep your home together. But see, it starts at the point of salvation. And if you've never been saved, I'm going to ask Kenny to come. I don't have an outline, so I guess I'm done. Because on my outline, normally I have a closing. Here's my closing. I want you to listen real hard. I'm letting it get quiet so you can listen to them real hard because God is speaking to every one of you right now. And He's saying, I love you. And it's a perfect love. It's full of mercy. It's full of forgiveness. It's full of strength. It's full of reassurance. It'll cast out your fear. See, some of you are fearful that God won't accept me. I've been too bad. Perfect love casts out fear. Only God can love you that way. His love is unconditional. He doesn't doesn't care what you've done. You're, You're not shocking Him. He's known what you've been doing all along. And the Scripture says He still loves you. Isn't that remarkable? He still loves you while you're a sinner. But see, He loves people who have gone to hell. He didn't send them to hell. He loves people who have gone to hell. If not, John 3.16 wouldn't be true. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. But it's a conditional promise that whoever believes in Him, you have to believe that God, by faith, did it. It can't be by your works. It has to be by His grace, through faith. 
See, he loves people that have gone to hell. And you say, why didn't he just reach down and snatch them back? Because that wouldn't be real love. God's saying, I'm love, but I want you to understand it's a just love. It's a perfect love. And I'll love you while you're at your worst, but I want you to love me because I'm at my best. I'm sending my best, most beloved son. See, if you reject him, you have rejected God's gift of salvation through his son. You have mocked what God did for you with his beloved son. And you can only find the father through the son because the son came full of grace and truth that we might see what the father looks like. Somebody had to pay the debt. Somebody had to die for the wages of sin is what? Death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord because God loves you. That's the implication. You couldn't do it. You couldn't do it. You are condemned already. That's why Jesus came. Read John 3, 18. You are condemned already. Jesus didn't come to condemn. He came to set you free. But it starts with you. What will you do with God's love here today? Bow your heads with me. If, if there's anyone in this place that's not saved, you say, I've never had it explained like that. I've never heard it like that. I've never really trusted in Jesus Christ my Savior, who God sent because He loved me. He sent Christ to die on the cross because He loved me because I was a sinner, and I'm, I'm condemned, and He freed me. But you've never trusted in that today. You say, Pastor, I want to receive Christ as my Savior. I've never seen Him like that. With, with every head bowed, every eye closed, would you maybe just raise your hand and where I could pray for you. So I've, I've never been saved. I've never accepted Christ. God bless you, ma'am. God bless you, sir, on the back. God bless you. Two adults, God bless you. Keep your hand up high, please. There's two. Is there another? God loves you so much, He's never stopped loving you. And you say, well, I, I, I didn't know that. I know. That's what's amazing. He's loving you at this moment. He's loving you right now at this moment that your hand had to go up because you're, you're feeling the love of God. You're feeling and experience the love of God. Amen. Pastor Jacob, are you up to praying? Maybe Patty can come and pray with this lady. I got a gentleman on the back, on the back row, uh, that I, I need one of our... Uh, Joe, would you go uh, uh, to that, that gentleman on the back? Amen. And raise his hand. Want to experience God's love. You say, what are they going to do? All they're going to do is pray with you. They're going to tell you through prayer how much God loves you. They're going to make it easy for you right there. Is there another? Two, God's loving everybody in this building. Everybody in this building God is loving. There's no one left out. You say, Pastor, I've been, I've been a fool. I've been, I've been outside of myself. I've been doing stuff I shouldn't have been doing. I've been thinking what I shouldn't have been thinking. I've been going where I shouldn't have been going. And, and Pastor, my heart is hard today. And does God still love me? If you're that way this morning, I want you to raise your hand. Say, pray for me. I, I've been outside the will of God. I've gotten outside the love of God. I can't even feel it. I need prayer this morning. I see that hand. I see that hand hand is there another hand is there another one god bless you and you is there anyone else anyone else you can put your hands down father i pray this morning that you'll work in the hearts of these people that those that need to be saved will be saved the two that raised their hand i praise the lord with all of my heart for I think they feel the love of God. They sense the love of God. The love of God is powerful. It's something that we can sense by faith. It has substance. It has reality. For faith, it's a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We see the evidence by that hand going up. We see the substance of your love as we feel it in our heart, as we feel it in our mind, as we feel it through just our spirit, as our hairs on our arms start to raise up and tingle just a little bit. Love, Father, I just pray this morning that the love of God be felt in this place by every person. A place full of people who are not perfect, people who are flawed, people who have all kind of foibles and, and, and obstacles in front of them. And we do battle with Satan every day, but Father, let us always be reminded of how much you love us. When it comes to doubt and discouragement, let us cling to your word, which testifies by the Holy Spirit that testifies how much you love us. Father, I pray for each and every person here today. No one left out. You love everyone. 
Father, when we go outside that building, we understand that those people you love too, we can't comprehend it. We can think, oh, you love us because we're good people, but outside those doors, you love people who are not church people. You love people who are not God people. You love people who are not religious people. And Father, I pray that we'd reflect your love and that they would see you through us and that we would let our light shine the way that Jesus told us and not to hide it under a bush. And Father, I pray this morning that you will be done in our lives. We want to thank you for what you've done. Two people raising their hands for salvation. Numerous people thinking they're too bad and they have maybe forgotten the love of God. Father, I know we can never escape it. Your love is with us when we wake up and when we go to bed. Wherever we go, whatever we do, whatever we say, whatever we feel through the day, your love is with us. Father, we praise you here this morning. We're going to turn this prayer into a time of praise. Amen? So, Father, we just thank you for what you've done, what you're doing, and what you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray and ask these things. Amen. Give a mighty shout to God for His love and His goodness. Amen. And uh, amen. If this wasn't your cup of tea, I'll be back to my tea brewing next week with an outline. I love you. God bless you. Don't forget Wednesday night. Amen. And be there with us.